welcome to Jazz Zone Together, our new online jazz community where we'll provide jazz education and classroom resources, interviews with jazz educators, artists, and celebrities, along with valuable tips and repertoire suggestions. Today, we welcome Dr. J.B. Dias, noted jazz educator, musician, author, and he currently serves as Vice President for Education and Curriculum Development at the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz. Now I'll turn the mic over to Dick Dunscombe to conduct the interview with JB. Take it away, Dick. Thank you, Bob, and welcome my friend, JB Dias. Thank you for having me. It's so good to see you again. We're on opposite ends of the country. We are indeed. And um, we are so proud that you've agreed to come on because you're, you're doing some very, very valuable things for jazz education these days. And uh, I know that, that um, you're uh, in, the, in the mix of all of that activity now, but first let's go back and talk about the beginning of your career and give us some insight into your early years and the path that you chose. Well, I'm glad you asked that because it's, it's a kind of a bizarre path that I took. First of all, I was never going to go to college. I mean, I was a rock and roll guitar player in high school <laughs> and, and pretty good. You know, I, I, you know, I thought I was probably the, you know, the best guitar player at my high school in the city and the state. Mm -hmm. and, and if, if it weren't for Jimi Hendrix, I would have been the best. That's, that was my <laughs> attitude. Um, little did I know that I was nowhere, but I thought I was. So right after high school, um, I lucked into a top 40 band playing six nights a week all over the country. And I, you know, I didn't know anything about jazz, but, and I was playing rock and roll. I was 18 years old, and I was, you know, remember I was making more money than my dad, and I just thought, man, I, I just had it made. And the, the bass player and the uh, keyboard player in the band, they were into jazz. They were always listening to jazz. And I really respected them because, you know, they were much older and wiser. I think one was 19 and, and the other was 20. So I thought, man, these guys must mm -hmm. really know where it's at. So on one of our nights off, um, we go to a jam session, which they bring me along, and they're sitting in. They say, come on up and jam. And I fell on my face because I was used to playing – uh, the exact solos off the records, because that was how you did it in the top 40 days. You, I played mm -hmm. the same solo every night right off the record. And um, I said, how, how do you guys know how to improvise? And they said, hey, we went to community college for a couple of years. <laughs> and I'm like, community college? Man, i got to get me into one of those and, and, and learn about this jazz thing. So they played for me Chameleon by Herbie Hancock, the Headhunters. And... That was it. I went to school, I studied, I became a bass player, and the rest is uh, the rest is history as far as my playing career. But how I got into education is another uh, another interesting story, I think. So I'm playing in Palm Beach, Florida, in a band called The Kids Next Door, and The Kids Next Door we sang four part harmony like the Modern Airs and like uh, the Manhattan Transfer and Singers Unlimited. And we also did top 40 tunes, and we were huge in the Palm Beaches. And I, I remember I was living the life, getting up at, at, uh, at, uh, at 3 in the afternoon, you know, hanging out, playing my gig six nights a week, getting up at 3 in the afternoon. And you know why I was getting up at 3 in the afternoon, Dick? Why? It's because that's when General Hospital came on. <laughs> And I was hooked. That was the Luke and Laura days. I don't know if any of your listeners are um, old enough to remember Luke and Laura on General Hospital. So I had a revelation. I looked in the mirror and I just said, man, what are you doing? In my, in my young 20s, I'm getting up at 3 o'clock so I can watch General Hospital. There's got to be more to life than this. So I go to Florida Atlantic University where I finished my, where I'd finished my bachelor's degree. Bill Prince was my mentor there. And I made an appointment to ask him, I said, can I just come in and talk to you? And I said, I told him my story. Man, I played in this great band, best players I've ever played with, most money I've ever made, but I'm not fulfilled. I'm not fulfilled. I'm getting up to watch General Hospital. I play and watch General Hospital. He said, man, why don't you try teaching? 
why don't you look into teaching? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know if I have the right temperament to be a teacher. Well, as fate would have it, while I was in the office, the phone rang, and it was the uh, chairman of the of Broward Community College Music Department, and asked Bill, he said, by, on the phone, he said, my guitar player, my guitar teacher, adjunct guitar teacher, just split in the middle of the semester to go on the road with the Pointer Sisters, which was a big, uh, you know, famous pop group in the day. And we need, a, we need a guitar teacher to come in one day a week. And uh, do you have anybody? And he says, well, hold on a minute. And he says, look, I got a teaching gig for you right now. You want to try this teaching thing or not? And <laughs> it was on the spot. And I went, oh, well, 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 okay. So I started teaching guitar lessons one day a week. I think there were six students, one after the other. And I loved it. And I went back to school, got a master's degree at University of Miami in jazz pedagogy got my Ph.D. in uh, music education from Indiana University, and now I am a jazz educator. I still play. Well, I haven't had a gig since, uh, uh, since uh, January because of the pandemic, but I still play about 50 dates a year, and, uh, but I'm a jazz educator. That's, that's what I write down on my tax return. That's a great, great path. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that others have followed a similar thing, and that's a good message for those young players today. So uh, I know that you're deeply involved now with the Herbie Hancock Institute. Talk a little bit about that and some of its most far-reaching activities. Well, the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz were housed here at UCLA and our main administrative, administrative officer are in Washington, D.C. We're a jazz education and outreach organization. And we do jazz education and outreach all over the world. Uh, several of the components, uh, probably um, our most famous two, are we sponsor International Jazz Day along with UNESCO. UNESCO is an arm of the United Nations. And the Herbie Hancock Institute. And by the way, Herbie Hancock is our chairman. And Herbie Hancock is UNESCO's International Goodwill Ambassador. So it was a perfect marriage. So we do that every year, every April 30th in a different country. Uh, this year was the first time it was virtual because it's April 30th and anybody, and it was amazing. It was, you know, to me it was as good or not better than the live concerts that we've done. And they've been in Australia and Cuba and um, Russia. And uh, when we did it in the United States, we did it at the White House, um, Barack and Michelle Obama hosted, and Morgan Freeman was the host, and it was just amazing with Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter and Esperanza Spaulding, and I mean, just a list of who's who's, including some crossover people like Aretha Franklin and Sting. And that's Jazz Day, International Jazz Day, and you can watch that concert at jazzday.com, by the way. We also have our international jazz competition every year. And that's always held at the Kennedy Center. It's a different instrument every year, and it's launched the careers of people like Chris Potter and Eric Alexander and Joshua Redman and uh, the Gretchen Parlato and Ambrose Ecclusery, and the list goes on and on. Just wonderful, wonderful people. Gerald Clayton have uh, either won or been finalists in that in that competition over the years. And then we have our college program at UCLA. At the Herb Alpert School of Music, it's a complete fellowship. Every student who comes, it's a graduate program, so they come in with a bachelor's degree already. And we only take between six and eight students every two years, and they form a, a group, you know, a, a sextet or a septet or an octet, and they take all their classes together. But rather than taking a regular jazz history course, for instance, they spend a week with Herbie Hancock. They spend a week with Wayne Shorter. They, they, they have lessons with um, visiting artists every week, Jerry Braganzi and, and Christian McBride and Chris Potter. I mean, just a who's who. And so they do two years of this uh, an amazing experience. They tour, they record, and then they go on the, uh, and then they, then they get a master's degree conferred by UCLA and a professional diploma from the Herbie Hancock Institute. Now, what I do is I oversee our jazz education and outreach programs. And uh, we have a National Performing Arts High School program where I visit, 
uh, 11 performing arts high schools around the country, and I mentor the teachers, teaching them how to better teach jazz, and I also uh, work directly with the students. From that pool, we put together two all-star groups, and we tour the country with major artists playing in high schools, having kids teach kids that there's <laughs> more to music than rock and roll and hip-hop, and they need to check out jazz. Now, if I go in and talk to them, say that, they don't hear me, but when kids who look like them and talk like them, it's always a diverse group, and so they're, they're, they're teaching the, they're teaching the uh, intangibles that jazz teaches, like teamwork and unity with ethnic diversity and the vital importance of really listening to one another. And that's the Herbie Hancock Institute in a nutshell. Wow, that is amazing. And I know that you were involved prior to Herbie Hancock Institute with the Brubeck Institute. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of, about that and the highlights of your time uh, with that program? I was, at, uh, I was at the Brubeck Institute for four years. I was their um, first executive director. And, you know, when, before I went there, I was already at the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz as education director. And so I was in that rare position, Dick, where I had a job. But they recruited me for that job. And before I was going to leave the job that I had, which I really liked, I wanted to make sure that uh, this was really something that was worth leaving my job for. So I called up um, uh, George Moore, who was Dave Brubeck's assistant, after they offered me the position, and said, I'd like to spend... Uh, I'd like to spend a couple of days with Dave, if it's okay, just to talk about his vision for the Institute and see if it matches mine. A and it w would that be cool? And he said, uh, so, and he was, uh, he was uh, living, Dave, in Wilton, Connecticut. So I said, if you can just recommend a hotel and give, give me a couple of days, I'll, you know, I'll fly at my own expense and, and just spend a couple of days with Dave. So he called back a couple of days later and says, yes, here are the dates, but Dave insists that you stay at the house. And I said, I, 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 you know, I couldn't impose. And he said, no, no, he really, he really wants you to stay. I said, I, I, I couldn't. He said, look, he said, JB, if you come to Wilton the be and get a hotel, the best we're going to be able to get you is a suite. Uh, <laughs> if you come to the house, we can give you a wing. <laughs> and I went, he said, and he said, JB, man, you got to see this place, man. Come on. <laughs> and he was talking to me like we were friends, and I just loved that. And, it, you know, it was interesting be how loyal Dave was because George had been his personal assistant for years and years. I mean, even George had grandkids. And so I go to the house for the first time, and uh, Dave meets me at the door along with Iola, his wife, and he says, come on in. He says, come on in. You, you can have the divorce wing. <laughs> and I said, uh, oh, the divorce wing, what's that? He said, that's where all my sons came back to live when they got their divorces. <laughs> so I immediately loved this cat. I mean, he was just great. So we spent the next three days talking. First of all, there were seven, seven or nine pianos throughout mm. the house. Mm beautiful grand piano and on and he had on the wall the, the photographs of himself not only with like Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington and all these people but with all the presidents and the Queen of England and I'm just going this is so surreal and I'm having breakfast with him in the morning and I'm just trying to keep my mind on the conversation because <clears throat> I'm here in Dave Brubeck's home <clears throat> He had a piano on stilt stick so that because he would compose so he'd be able to stand yeah. and compose because his back would get sore. So he had this one piano you'd, you'd have to <laughs> he'd stand up and play. It was just the most amazing three days I had. We talked about everything, life, uh, music, classical music, jazz, life after death, religion, um, politics, health. I mean, mm -hmm. we, he, he became like my, my grandfather and mentor and that was the best part of being at the Brubeck Institute was getting to getting to know this not only this great player of course he's a great player everybody knows right. that but what a unique 
individual and true humanitarian? Well, I'll tell you, some of it rubbed off on you. <laughs> now let's go back even a little further. Where we first met, which was in Miami, and you were at the New World School for the Arts, and you had a jazz program that I couldn't believe. And I was just starting the FIU program. Talk a little bit about those days with those kids and who they are today. Well, yeah, Dick, you know, I think back of our, our uh, South Florida days and I, I just smile. And Florida International University, I remember nobody was talking about FIU at all, it wasn't even on the map. And then you showed up and all of a sudden you had this amazing jazz program there with these people like Gary Campbell, who's one of my favorite saxophone players. And talk about jazz educators, he was one of the writers, as you know, of Patterns for Jazz, which was like one of the first jazz books. Incredible player, and then, and then, you know, the hottest trumpet player on the scene at the time, and still great Arturo Sandoval. And I remember you, you bringing these cats over to the school and doing clinics at New World School of the Arts. But I love New World School of the Arts. In fact, that's one of the, you know, my tenure there was, you know, the, the impetus of, of me creating this international uh, performing arts high school jazz program that the Herbie Hancock Institute does now. But we had a real scene there, uh, you know, winning the Downbeat Awards and playing everywhere and playing at Midwest and IAJE and all that. And we had some wonderful players come out of that school, um, both EJ and Marcus Strickland. We had one band with EJ and Marcus Strickland, you know, great jazz recording artists now, and Seneca Black, who played lead trumpet in the band. And then right after that, he went on to play with the Lincoln Center band with Winton Marcellus for the next four or five years after he graduated. And, and Mike Rodriguez, who's a great trumpet player, now teaching at the San Francisco Conservatory. Um, Alex Lacamori. Now, a lot of you might not know the name Alex Lacamori. He's a wonderful jazz pianist we had in high school. And, you know, Alex was kind of a, I mean, wonderful player because um, he was in the, in the top jazz combo, and, and, but he also loved playing piano for the musicals that the school did. So we did West Side Story. He's the rehearsal pianist. I'm going, where's, a, uh, where's Alex? He's re with rehearsal with West Side Story. <laughs> so the, the sub for Alex was Martin Bejarano. That's, that's how deep we are. Mm -hmm. Martin Bejarano is now the piano professor at the University of Miami. But Alex was always hanging around with the theater kids as much as he was hanging around with the jazz kids. And of course, he'd be teased for that by the jazz kids, as, as you know, cruel as high school students can be. Well, Alex has the last laugh because he now has two Tonys for writing the music for not only In the Heights, but mm -hmm. Hamilton. Mm -hmm. He's the orchestrator for Hamilton and, uh, you know, I'm watching PBS one night and they have Hamilton, uh, they have the Hamilton uh, singers and, you know, actors and doing, doing a couple of scenes mm -hmm. at the White House. And there's Alex playing the piano. Mm -hmm. So Alex Lacamori, Hamilton. And uh, of course, now he's richer than God and living on the Upper West Side and mm -hmm. <laughs> he can hang out with anybody he wants. <laughs> so I love my New World days. I really learned a lot of, a lot of great things about teaching. Uh, one was I used your book back in those days, your first book. Remember this one? Oh, yes. <laughs> Remember this one, Jazz Pedagogy? And Willie Hill, this book introduced me to Willie Hill, who got involved. At, at the time, it was the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz. Now it's the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz. Right. And, um, and now, now with our all-city jazz band, which is, which is another thing I do for the Herbie Hancock Institute, these, these are the top players, top high school players, in Los Angeles. And I mean, they sound like a pro band. You know, LAUSD, Los Angeles Unified School District, is mm -hmm. the second largest school district in the country. So I have a huge pool to pick the top 18 wow. kids every year. And, uh, and so we just started to get into this book uh -huh. when the pandemic right. hit. And so this is great. And um, the thing that I love about this book, first of all, you got Sam Jackson and Charlie Hill and some other people writing arrangements that go along with exactly what you're talking about. But the thing that so many jazz educators don't do is take care of the listening. The listening. You know, they just hand out the charts. 
and um, and they don't take care of how important it is to listen. Here, there's real listening assignments. You know, you haven't learned West End, blues, you haven't listened to West End blues. You're not a for realer. You know, you've got to take care of that, and it's spelled out. And uh, especially these high school band directors, they are spread so thin with having to do marching band. Oh, my God. Marching band and concert band. And if they have an orchestra and a pep band and all these kind of things, and many of them do, don't have much education in jazz at all. I mean, I, I've seen, you know, oboe players, they got their degree in music education, and all of a sudden they're put in front of a jazz band. Now what do I do? Well... Yeah, the jazz, uh, the jazz Zone book, a great place to start. And um, although it's for, um, I think that it's, you know, for um, people new to jazz education, I suppose many a pro will find it very uh, useful as well. Well, thank you so much. And that was unsolicited, by the way, everybody. <laughs> okay. So um, you, you did a recent lecture entitled, What is Jazz and Why It's Important to the World? Talk a little bit about that and give us a brief synopsis of it. Well, jazz is the universal language. You know, when we have International Jazz Day, it's always in a different country, and we have these stellar performers from all over the world, um, many don't speak English, doesn't matter. They get there, they come together. Probably more than any other music, jazz teaches us about inclusivity. Jazz teaches our most deeply held values, like teamwork and unity with ethnic diversity and the correlation of hard work and goal accomplishment. In jazz, it's a one-to-one -one correlation. The more you practice, the better you get. The better you practice, the better you get. Jazz also teaches us, especially young people, about the vital importance of finding a passion for something while they're young and going for it, believing in yourself. You know, in this uh, society today where you want instant gratification, some things just cannot be instantly gratified. Jazz takes time. Jazz teaches you how to take a long-term project and to keep, uh, to keep getting better. And there's probably no better example of democracy than a jazz ensemble. Because what's democracy? It's individual freedom, but with responsibility to the group. You know, in jazz, every musician can play however they want. You know, when it, in a jazz combo, there's no music up there. I mean, they've all, they all know the melody and the chords, and then after that, they play whatever they want to play as long as it makes the whole group sound better. So individual freedom, but with responsibility to the group. The jazz ensemble is a, an example of a perfect democracy. I mean, can you imagine uh, how it would be if um, Congress were made up of all jazz musicians? <laughs> because jazz teaches us the vital importance of really listening to one another. In jazz, you can't function unless you're actively and intensely listening to one another and responding and supporting. If Congress were made up of all jazz musicians, we'd have a, so, so, so fewer problems. Well, maybe your next step should be to become a senator <laughs> <laughs> and, and proliferate throughout. Yeah, that, that's a great story. Yeah, that's that, about the last thing that I would do. <laughs> let, let, me, you know, let me pour gasoline in my eyes before <laughs> I do that. You know, we talked earlier about your career in, uh, in colleges and universities. I know that you attended and got degrees from the University of Miami and Indiana University, two fantastic jazz programs. Talk a little bit about the educators that have most impacted your career. Well, there are two that are really my two or three, my three biggest mentors, Bill Prince, mm -hmm. who started at Florida Atlantic University and finished his uh, career at uh, North Florida University. Yeah. 
and then Jamie Abersold. You know, Jamie, I've taught at the Jamie, this was my first summer in 33 years not teaching at the Abersol camp, and it was because of the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I would watch Jamie teach. He's a master teacher, and also a lot of people don't know Jamie's a great player. Yeah. Jamie's, I mean, Jamie's got his own unique sound. He's an alto saxophone player, and he's also an excellent piano player. You know, he comps on some of those uh, mm -hmm. play-along records, and it's so clear and nice voicings. Uh, and some of those books are um, transcribed, and I use that in my teaching, you know, mm -hmm. great voicings, great feel. And uh, Jamie, you know, is also a, a great bass player. You know, it's interesting that at the, at the, at the, in, at the Abersold Summer Jazz Camp, on the very last day, the bass faculty, which I'm a member of, and there's nine of us, and there's, they're great players. It's Rufus Reed and, and John Goldsby and Lynn Seaton, who's the... Uh, jazz bass instructor at uh, University of North Texas. I mean, just wonderful bass faculty. So we line up, all nine of us, and we play a bass nonet. And it, we, we play and everybody, everybody, takes, everybody takes a chorus, you know, right on down the line. And then Jamie comes through, you know, happens to walk mm -hmm. in, takes somebody's bass, and plays a better solo and walks a better line than any of us. And Rufus just goes, now, that, that ain't fair. <laughs> <laughs> he's such a talented uh, and a musician, and he's also a humanitarian and philanthropist. Philanthropist. He's supported our jazz programs, supports the Herbie Hancock Institute. And then, of course, at Indiana University, David Baker. And I know you knew David, and we're good friends with David. And um, yes. we just lost David a few years ago. But I don't think there's many jazz musicians alive that haven't been affected by David Baker, either by him directly or by his students who have taught them or by playing with students who have rubbed off them. It's, it, it's never more than a one or two degree uh, s separation, uh, degree of separation between any jazz musician and David Baker on the contemporary scene. I mean, even, even people like you know David Liebman and Chris Potter. Chris Potter was at the Abersol camp in David Baker's combo when he played alto saxophone and sounded like Charlie Parker mm. at age 15. I remember, um, I remember, who's this kid? This kid, he sounds just like Bird. And, um, and Jamie says, hey, do you listen to a lot of Bird? And Chris was so shy, and he said, no, no, not, not really. And then I can't remember what it was, but uh, it, like, some significant date in Charlie Parker's career was a significant date for Chris, and I'm not sure if it was birthday or what. And then, and then, Jamie said, "And then, what are what are your initials, Chris? CP." <clears throat> so for the rest of the camp, Chris would walk by. I remember Bobby Shue would walk by. He'd start playing the Twilight yeah. Zone on the. <laughs> like, here comes the reincarnation. So, David Baker. Uh, oh, yeah. Jamie Abersall, Bill Prince. Yeah, all great. And of course, my University of Miami faculty were great. Win si Witt Seidner, Don yeah. Kaufman, Gary Lindsay, Gary Keller, all those cats too, for sure. Okay, so now let's look forward a little bit. Share with us some of what we can expect from you and the Institute down the road. Well, I think we're really leading the way with this virtual teaching this uh, you know international jazz day was done virtually and dick you really need to check that out jazzday.com i mean it's yep. it's uh, you know it's uh, herbie and get a list of some of the people that were there marcus miller john mclaughlin cecile mcclure and salvan jane monheit uh, monheit uh, john scolfit lee rittenauer liz wright Dee, Dee bridgewater diane reeves joey d and francisco just an amazing montage put together of this virtual thing using current footage where they actually played in their living room mm -hmm. and then footage from the White House and from Russia and from Istanbul and all these places where we did International Jazz Day, New Orleans, um, the UN. And it, it's, it's just amazingly done all, all virtual. You'll hear Jane Monheit singing in her living room a cappella over the rainbow. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. 
Unbelievable. So virtual. So what did we do this summer? We did 24. I did. I presented uh, on behalf of the Herbie Hancock Institute um, 24 Jazz in America webinars. And this was, the, we had students from over 30 countries all over the world participating. And we had three, it was jazz history, eight sessions apiece for 10th through 12th graders, mm -hmm. and then eight sessions for 7th um, through 9th graders, and then 4th through 6th graders, all age appropriately presented. For instance, in the, the older students, we talked about Billie Holiday and, and, and uh, Strange Fruit. Um, we didn't talk about that with, you know, with the young kids. But we talked about most everything else, you know, just, mm -hmm. just made age appropriate. And the, on the penultimate, uh, the penultimate webinar, number 23, we had a special guest for these fourth through sixth graders. And that was Herbie Hancock himself. Who, who said he could give us 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. He gave us 35 minutes just mm -hmm. answering questions from these kids. And I was just so thrilled because um, here's this fourth grader said, did you really play with Miles Davis? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it broke my heart. I just thought it was great. And uh, why, why did you go through so many styles? It was just great. And so the kids had been paying attention. So mm -hmm. we're going to do more virtual teaching. I'm now... Uh, I've just started teaching virtually. Remember I told you I visited all these performing arts high schools where I mentor the students and uh, right. I mentor the teachers and work with the students. Well, now I'm uh, doing it virtually and I'm teaching at my old alma mater, New World School of the Arts, tomorrow, teaching all their jazz students. And we're going to talk about jazz nomenclature, Good. how chord symbols, what they represent, and the difference between specific and basic symbols. And... Uh, I'll be doing that at about five or six of these schools. And then, it, then All City Jazz Band starts on, November, on uh, September 26, and that's going to be virtual. Mm -hmm. So we're figuring that out as, as we go. And then I'm going to continue, um, you know, writing my articles for Downbeat uh, Magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, Dick, since, uh, since you and I were together back in the early uh, days in uh, South Florida, I've, I've written... 10 or 11 articles for Downbeat. And I want to just uh, share, with, share one with you right now that I can show you because if any of your, visit, uh, any of your listeners want one of these, they can email me and I can, and I can send them. Uh, one is, uh, let, me, let me share the screen with you for a second. Um, can you see this article, Living the Dream? Mm hmm Sure can. Okay, so what I have on here is how to get a job in jazz education. And I go step by step on how not only um, how to apply for a job, where the jobs are, what skill set and credentials you'll need, um, how to do an interview, how to do an audition, and then general tips, do's and don'ts. Here's where a lot of people falter. They get all the way to the interview and then they say the wrong things. But also on here... I have a, um, I have this sheet right here, which I've made it into the, on this PDF where you can hit the link and it'll take you right there. Like I talk about that you need to have jazz piano skills. I talk about how every jazz educator has to be able to functionally play, be a functional musician. Besides, their, besides being well-versed on their main instrument, they need to be able to play piano, and then some bass, drums, and even guitar, because so many times those people get neglected in high school bands. So you click on, you click on this, on the link here, and you'll automatically get right to my Jazz Piano Voicings handout, mm -hmm. where I talk about it, and then I give you actual vo one-hand voicings, yeah. and two five ones. Voicings for two five ones jazz that for, for the left hand, and then two five ones in minor, and then I even have two handed voicings here. So you give this sheet to your piano player, and they're automatically going to start sounding more like jazz rather than playing basic seventh chords and 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 so forth. Um, the other one I have that um, 
The other one I have that I think your listeners will find interesting is this one, uh, Jazzing Up Jazz Band. Do you see that one in front of you now? Yes, yes. Jazzing Up Jazz Band, that's me teaching in, at the Houston High School for the Performing Arts. And I give a step-by-step, -step, and by the way, it's amazing how we're on the same wavelength. You read my article, it's going to make you want to even get this book even more because it's, it's telling you what to do. I, I talked about doing the trilogy, about how be, when learning a tune before doing the big band arrangement, they should learn the tune just like a, a combo. And, they should, and I give the nine steps that they should do. Like the first thing, they should learn the root movement of the tune. Then they should learn the chords. Then they should learn the scales. And if they're doing a tune with two five ones, they uh, have the seventh resolve to the third like that. Then after they all learn the tune, then they, uh, and the chords, I usually, when I do my big band at, um, when I do my all city big band, everybody learns the tune, everybody, you know, we go in that order. We listen mm -hmm. to the definitive recording, just like what you say. Listen to definitive recording, everybody learns the form, everybody plays the root movement along with the definitive recording, everyone plays the chords with the definitive recording, everyone plays the scales the chords imply, then they all learn the head. Mm -hmm. So they've been listening to the definitive recording, I give them lead sheets for the head, but say play it like you've heard it. Then I have everybody solo. Now, not for 32 bars, but we go through and if it's a blues, everyone just takes four bars a piece, keeping their place, or if it's a... If it's a 32-bar tune, eight bars a piece. So, you know, four students per chorus, everyone. And some solos sound really good. Some, they're just playing chord tones or paraphrasing the head. Then I go, and it's in, in the article, we transcribe something from the definitive recording, not a whole solo, not even a whole chorus, mm -hmm. maybe just a phrase. Then we all learn that phrase. Then we all solo again. And everyone has to incorporate that phrase somehow, even if it sounds mm -hmm. contrived. It's okay in the beginning, because you have to learn the language. Then, after all that, then we hand out a big band arrangement of the same mm -hmm. piece. They see where it's come from. They know the chords. They know the scales. They've heard the definitive recording. It's not just the second alto part. They know what's going on. And that's, that's in my Jazzing Up Jazz Band article. Yeah. And uh, one other one I'll... I'll, I'll talk about, and again, I'm happy to share these with any of your listeners. Um, this is something you want to teach your high school students, and that is how to get the big scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I go step by step on how your students should prepare to go to school absolutely free. And I talk about letters of recommendation, and I talk about audition repertoire and the scales you need to know and what you need to do with the audition and how you should play. Make it obvious that you've checked out the definitive recording during your audition. You don't, you don't want to make it sound contrived, but you want to subtly let the um, audition panel hear you've done your due diligence vis-a-vis -vis listening and transcribing. And I talk about what pianists should do and guitarists and bassists and drummers and so forth. And again, I have all these materials where you can just click on, click on the link and uh, prepare to nail your auditions. You click right there, and there comes up another great article. And I can be glad to send anybody a PDF, or we can put them up on your site, or however you want to do it. And there you go. What a great wealth of information this has been. This is fabulous. We want to be sure to get your uh, links on our credits that roll after the interview is over so that people can not only be in touch with you, but with the Hancock Institute and some of the programs that are going on. So let's be sure that we get that uh, from you. I'm My telling pleasure. you, baby, this Spread is the word, you know, this has been, you know we're in this. That's you it. and I are, you know, you're one of my mentors and I'm, you know, I'm carrying it on. And, you know, uh, the more people that get into jazz, I really believe the better world we're going to have because of those, because of those values that jazz teaches. Yeah, playing jazz is great and it's, and it's a lot of fun and everybody should do it. But, you know, not everybody's going to be, you know, Chris Potter or John Coltrane, but it's a lot of fun. But everyone who, everyone 
is going to learn these life skills about teamwork and unity with ethnic diversity. So uh, the, the, I'm, I'm so glad that you're u using the jazz zone to spread the word because not just because it's going to make better musicians and more jazz aficionados, but it's going to make better world citizens. Amen. Well, JB, thank you for sharing the time with us today. I am sure this interview will be over the top for most of the jazz educators and jazz students that uh, will be able to link up with it. And it's so wonderful to see you, my friend. Be safe and be well. Thank you very much. Thank you, JB. Thank you, Bob. To our viewers, we appreciate you joining us today and being a part of Jazz Zone together. We hope you found the presentation of JB's to be of real value. We hope you'll join us for future episodes. In the meantime, please stay safe and please keep making music.